Hello, good morning, Evan Franco. Hi, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Emanuela Mazzonis. I have assisted Francesco Bonami in creating the Me Family project. And uh, today we are here with Evan Franco Mattes, who I want to thank you first of all for being with us and for having accepted to participate to this uh, convers online conversation that is part of our public program in the Me Family platform that has been launched uh, uh, at the end of October. And today we are at our fourth appointment. So uh, before I start uh, my questions, our conversation, I would like to give a, a brief introduction to the public about Evan Fra Franco, who are a duo uh, active since the early nineties in the art world. They have exhibited under a pseudonym that is still active, if I'm not wrong, um, 01001etc.org. <laughs> uh, it's an internet domain uh, whose mysterious identity fits perfectly in an era when uh, digital languages and the role of the web were just starting to enter the contemporary art scene. You are both fascinated by the evolution of the digital world and the way internet has changed the methods of social and political interaction between individuals and also the effects that the web has had on artistic production during the last 30 years. So you all, always have used the web to reveal stories um, you actually did it in a very interesting approach because you steal and copy data and images. You use also fake names, you change identities and all the while adopting transparent strategies without hiding uh, behind the web, always revealing what was your aim and your project. So, now, considering uh, the globalized society and this ever-changing uh, society and generation, uh, what difference do you see between the 19th and today? And how do you think was internet interpreted 30 years ago? And how much this interpretation has changed today if you think the interpretation of the internet is really changed in the last 30 years? Well, thank you, Manuela, and thank you to Francesco Bonami for organizing this great show. Thank you to Susan Cotter and all the team at Mudam. Um, well, the internet in the 90s was, of course, very different from what we have today. Uh, it changed so much that it's almost unrecognizable. In the beginning, the internet was decentralized and distributed. It was pretty much built and maintained by its users. So for example, we had our own server in our bedroom, which hosted our works. Um, so we owned a piece of the internet mm -hmm. and we could host and publish uh, our artist friends' artworks, books, images, and songs. Um, we were young, we were isolating, trying to make art, and we suddenly found ourselves in a global network of like-minded artists. Um, without any connections, without much resources, we could publish our works and gain visibility. One of the first works uh, we did was called Life Sharing, and mm -hmm. for three years we openly share our home computer making its content accessible on the internet. All our artworks, as well as private material, mm -hmm. including like emails, texts, photos, bank statements, were freely available for viewing through our website. Um, consider that social media didn't exist at the time, and so personal data were not a currency yet. So it was a reflection of uh, this first more exciting, perhaps more utopian atmosphere around the internet and free software ethics. The internet we have today is quite different. It's very centralized with a few small giants owning most of it. All our posts, 
photos, emails are constantly being captured and archived indefinitely and analyzed for commercial or uh, political purposes. Mm. As artists, we try, I think, to respond to these changes. Uh, we try to visualize these contradictions and to create works that embody them. Mm. Um, so in the 90s, we were obsessed with visibility. Today, we're interested in quite the opposite, invisibility, withdrawal, and um, what we call the peripheries of the internet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very interesting explanation. Uh, and I think it is very uh, also linked to uh, my second question, which is related to one of your recent project, because uh, as you, you just said, Eva, you use the, the, the net, if I can say the dark net, as your space to divulgate art. And now if I think about uh, a time out of joint, that is an on online exhibition that you recently uh, created, if I'm not wrong, for the Yerevan Biennial, uh, that is actually taking place completely on the dark net on the net. Uh, you describe this project as a remote location and periphery of the internet. So I would like to ask you a little bit more about this project also in relation to what you said just now that you are looking now for invisibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Time Out of Joint is an exhibition, an online exhibition we curated uh, for the Yerevan Biennale mm -hmm. uh, taking place entirely on the dark net. Uh, we borrowed the title from a novel by Philip K. Dick about the nature of reality with ordinary people experiencing the world unraveling around them. Yes. Um, actually, we had this idea of curating a show on the dark net for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the pandemic started, it suddenly felt uh, almost urgent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all art exhibitions worldwide uh, were and, and, and still are to a certain extent installed as uh, uh, ghost exhibitions without being seen by visitors, perhaps never to be seen. Yes. We wanted an exhibition that took invisibility not as an, a, an unfortunate setback, you know, as a flaw, uh, but simply as a departure from more traditional formats mm -hmm. uh, to bring the audience to a place they are not probably familiar with. So you could say if they, surface internet is like, uh, you know, Art Basel or something, mm -hmm. then the dark net would be your artist run space uh, in a dirty basement in Brooklyn. Um, a place that's uh, a bit harder to find that works mainly on word of mouth, but where you might discover something uh, unexpected. Uh, for the show, we commissioned uh, new works by six artists, uh, Joshua Cirella, Cluster Duck, David Horvitz, Vlad and Yoller, Amalia Ullman, and 2050 Plus Studio. Mm -hmm. um, the new works were added periodically uh, over mm -hmm. the duration of the show, and they were available to be seen, copied, or reused. Uh, some were specifically created, actually, to be taken away uh, others to disappear after the show. Well, the darkness reminds me very much of the 90s internet we were talking mm -hmm. about before, the pre-social media internet. Um, it's an uncharted territory. It's very different from the surface internet we're very familiar with. On the surface, mm -hmm. time is fast. Uh, everything is meant for immediate consumption and satisfaction. The darkness is also moving, but it operates at a slow speed. Pages load without brush. Um, think of slow as something positive, like slow food as opposed to fast food. It's anonymous, mm. it's free of commercial constrictions and it's full of possibilities. Craving for attention is what we do online anyway. On the darknet, you don't have any of the tools to quantify success there are no likes, no shares, no cookies, no comments, no recommendations. There's only content. Um, someone might find it frustrating 
Like, how am I going to know how much views as my video? Uh, but we actually think it's very liberating. It's almost Zen. Um, in a tree falling in a forest kind of way. It forces the FOMO out of you. So Time Out of Joy is an exhibition to visit from home and without rush. It's an experiment in the attention economy. Maybe um, the fact that you have to wait for a minute to see a photo load mm -hmm. and that the, you know this photo will be erased afterwards in the case of David Orbit's work, we make it will make you look longer. Mm -hmm. So is it possible yeah. to create a content that would put the viewer in a more contemplative mood online? That quiet, unheard feeling you have when you go to a museum and you see it in a black box and you breathe. Yes. So is our attention proportional to buffering time? Um, now I would jump one second to the other question, I will come back to the question about our uh, project, uh, Me Family Platform, because you just talk about the dark net. And one of my questions was uh, about your definition of dark net. So we said that, um, I mean, I can say that in your work, uh, in the fact that you are stealing data, putting data, uh, visible, you are raising questions that are very difficult to answer for um, the, the, the public, for normal person that are not very into, I think, the web and the dark net. So the questions are who is controlling our data, how and where the data are recorded and monitored and stored for how long, for example. Um, what is this cloud that we think is protecting and storing our data if they're really protecting. So um, you said in one interview and many times that the cloud is the real darknet. Now, Eva, you already told us about the darknet, about the fact that is only content. This is really interesting to me. Uh, I'm not very much uh, informed about the darknet. I'm honest because I'm not using it. I'm not uh, specialized. But what you said about contemplative mode, slow speed, I think is very interesting to um, know more, to understand more about this. I don't know if now, Franco, you want to define us what the dark net is uh, a little bit more. I know that Eva was already um, very exhaustive about this, but I don't know if you want to add uh, anything else. Sure. Um, well, the darknet um, is a is a network uh, that runs mm -hmm. uh, parallel to the internet, so it's not you know separate from it. Uh, it's just on a different layer. Yes. Uh, kind of like you know the seven and a half floor in Spike Jonze's movie, Being John Malkovich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remember that movie? Yes. <laughs> so to access this network, you need a a special software, for example, the Tor browser. Mm -hmm. uh, the darknet is just designed to let you communicate anonymously. Okay. Something that is no longer possible on the surface internet, in which our every move, including you know, this conversation, is being monitored and, and archived. Uh, the darknet is largely presented in mainstream media as a marketplace, you know, for drugs and, and weapons and pornography. Yeah. Uh, but it is also a platform that allowed uh, free speech for, for, you know, activists in uh, oppressive regimes mm -hmm. during the Arab Spring, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or the revelation of whistleblowers like uh, Chelsea Manning. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's anonymous does not only uh, free it from surveillance, uh, but also from advertisement. Uh, yes. Like what Eva mm -hmm. was saying, there is no quantification economy, you know, no data mining, no profiling, no cookies. Uh, there is a very interesting issue here regarding uh, the terminology, uh, because mm -hmm. terms like dark and transparent are being used in a very misleading way, uh, often on purpose. Mm -hmm. The internet uh, we are very, we use every day is considered uh, transparent. Uh, mm -hmm. It's colorful and sparkling, yeah. and its interface is very familiar to us. Uh, <clears throat> it's comforting almost. As a matter of fact, we spend most of our time in the same few 
locations, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and Amazon. Um, a handful of companies uh, fill up our time online, influencing what we see and how we see it. But despite the rhetoric of openness, uh, you know, sharing and transparency, the way they actually work is incredibly obscure. It's mysterious. <laughs> Contents are constantly monitored and filtered. Our personal data is traded between unknown parts to predict our future behaviors and possibly influence what we're going to buy uh, or who we're going to vote for. For example, if I were to ask you, uh, where are your photos? You know, where are your videos? Where exactly are they located and stored? Uh, you wouldn't know it. Yes, they are in the cloud. In the like cloud, but, yeah. but where is this cloud? It's not lightly hovering mm -hmm. over our heads. Uh, they're likely stored in a you know, huge gray windowless warehouse somewhere in the Utah desert, uh, heavily patrolled, uh, a place we cannot visit. Although all of our photos and memories and art are stored in it. So in a sense, the cloud is the real dark net. Yes. Thank you. It was a very clear explanation and we could keep talking about this, I think, for other two days because it's a really interesting uh, topic and uh, very actual and, ve and uh, it's, um, it's an issue that we are all facing, uh, our generation, but everyone, young kids, old people at the moment are also using the internet and uh, anyway they're in contact with the dark net so the whole world is completely involved in this so maybe next time we will organize another conversation yeah. about only the dark net now i would like to uh, continue our um, uh, talk and i would like to uh, mention the work we selected for our me family platform which is entitled ricardo and cat from 2018 and this is a um, we can say a contemporary portrait you have realized gathering images from a personal phone you actually offered to buy through a, a real call on social media so for $1,000, uh, Ricardo, this uh, person, this guy, he agreed to uh, that his personal data could be transformed into a real art project. Um, so through almost uh, 3,000 uh, images from uh, 2004 to 2017, the life of this person is, unfolds progressively. Uh, now, if I'm thinking about another project of yours that we actually um, included in our in the catalog of the exhibition Me Family, which is the others from 2011, you used a different approach. I would say you appropriate 10,000 images from people's personal computers, and you decided to then uh, include these um, images in an exhibition space. I remember when you described us the way we should install it, you said possibly you have to install it in a wrong space, which was a very interesting way to describe the installation detail of the piece. And uh, you did an operation that actually anticipated of many years the disclosure of Edward Snowden and at the same time foretold the disappearance of the separation between public and private life. So in both works, you are raising questions that are related to exhibitionism, voyeurism, also the self that is shaped in the digital area. I would like to ask you a little bit more about these two projects and the difference that you see between the two. Mm. That, that's an interesting question. Um, well, these two works uh, probably reflect the, the changes we were talking about earlier. Um, the others was created 10 years ago. Uh, we exploited a small software error through which we found thousands of private photos of people who were sharing them, uh, likely without knowing it. Mm -hmm. And we made a video slideshow with all the photos. 
uh, we chose the slideshow in the beginning because it's uh, the traditional like uh, vernacular way mm. to show photos. Um, and as you said, in the museum, the projection is always uh, wrong. Uh, it's wrongly placed, uh, for example, on a door. Uh, it's wrongly rotated. It's wrongly keystoned, as if my mom has set it up. Uh, but if you look at it, if you look at the photo, there is not much difference between these uh, supposedly private photos and what we post on social mm -hmm. media every day, mm -hmm. you know, from the edgy to the banal. Uh, but they're not all photos of uh, teenagers partying. Uh, there are also some very dramatic lives. Uh, for example, that of a woman uh, who has been beaten and uh, she's documenting uh, her bruises. And you cannot but start wondering what happened, uh, who did it. Did somebody else ever see these photos other than me? Um, so, you know, the work is addressing how ubiquitous th these powerful technologies are becoming and how, on the other hand, we don't fully understand how they work, uh, how they can be, you know, at the same time empowering and rendering us more vulnerable. Uh, in a sense, how the internet, uh, like, in a sense, like, how on the internet you don't own yourself. It's like, mm -hmm. it's the internet that own you. Mm -hmm. Well, Ricardo Ancat is um, in a way a follow-up to the others. Mm -hmm. It was commissioned by the Whitney Museum in New York. And uh, we could say it's the work based on our digital memories. Um, mm -hmm. Through an online open call, we found one person, Ricardo, who would, um, sell his used phone, including all the photos and the videos mm -hmm. contained therein, knowing that this material will become public. Like in the others, we created this slideshow of the phone contents that anyone can see, by the way, on the Moodham's website for the Me Family exhibition right now. Uh, the final video is one hour and a half and covers 13 years of Ricardo's life. We kept all the photos without uh, editing them in chronological order and without filtering or judging. Uh, we have manually changed the duration of each photo to emulate the pace at which we usually swipe through our phones. But the difference is very, are very, very subtle, almost imperceptible. Mm -hmm. And we added this uh, Jean Moreau's song, Each Man yes. Kiss the Thing He Loves, looping in the background. While a number of these photos have likely made it their way to the internet, the majority remain unseen, like most photographs nowadays. They accumulate on digital devices or remote cloud servers. They are ignored even by their author to be, only, to be forgotten and replaced by newer photos or newer devices. Thank you. Um, um, I, I think uh, we, can, um, we can actually uh, quite conclude because unfortunately we are running out of time. But before, I would like just to ask you my last question, which is about a solo show you had the uh, possibility to install at the moment, uh, considering the difficult situation everywhere in the world. So you installed this uh, solo show of yours at the Photo Museum in Winterthur in uh, Switzerland. And is, uh, if I'm not wrong, the first solo show of your work um, to be presented in a uh, museum context, featuring a new commission that will become also part of the museum permanent collection. Um, so I'm interested in knowing uh, from your point of view, how important is for you to be exhibited in an institutional frame, respect to use uh, the net as your uh, art platform, art display? Hmm. Yes, so yes, we were lucky to install the show, which will open likely, <laughs> likely early yes. March. So we're just waiting for it. Um, we worked on a follow-up of Ricardo Ancat, so that's, uh, it's called Hannah Ancat, and that's the work that's been commissioned by the museum, and it's now part of their collection. Um, there are a few 
new works in the show, uh, perhaps the most striking one, and you really need to go and see mm -hmm. if you want to experience this, experience it. It's this strange, uh, bright yellow cable tray that crosses mm -hmm. all the spaces in the museum, physically connecting all the works in the exhibition, making this infrastructure that is usually invisible, very present. It's on a very, um, low uh, waste level and accompanies mm -hmm. the museum visitors sometimes gently sometimes closing the doors and forcing the viewer in different paths um i think franco wants to show you oh of thank it. you i can see it i mean i wish we could all have the opportunity to go and see the show uh, in person no, in a, right in a sense this this thing is a is a metaphor of um how the internet is reprogramming our mm -hmm. lives in an unperceptible way. We like to say that the cable tray reprograms the museum. Um, so to go back to your question, parts uh, of the works are exhibiting in the museum and parts of them will appear online complementing okay. each other. Uh, for example, there's a new sculpture called Afcat, which is this uh, small taxidermy sculpture uh, based on an online meme for which we will publish a high res photo under public domain on Wikimedia. Um, there's a, oh my goodness. <laughs> there's a, <laughs> are we doing too much? Uh, there's a new series of videos called The Bots and they will also appear online on this art educational platform during the duration of the show. Okay. So to sum it, to sum it up, um, uh, the, it's, it's not only an exhibition of images, um, it's also an exhibition about image circulation, mm -hmm. uh, emphasizing where the images come from. Uh, in our case, most of the inspiration comes from our wanderings online and where they go and especially who is looking at these images. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. I really wish we can uh have the opportunity some way, somehow to see the exhibition. If it's gonna open, I hope so in March, for how long is gonna stay? Do you know? Until the end of May, it's a long run. So okay. luckily. Luckily, yes, <laughs> luckily. So um, actually I see the timing and I think <laughs> we run a little bit out of time, but it was very interesting. And I want to thank you both, uh, Franco and Eva, for this conversation. And I also want to uh, underline to the audience that is following us how interesting, again, is to explore your um, digital world, where I think we can all be able to learn remote elements of the net. We can discover. I think in my opinion is that through your work, we can discover the other side of the coin, revealing aspects of new technologies, world where sometimes uh, we can feel lost or I can feel lost, but other times we can find a guide towards an explored direction. So I think that um, thinking about contemporary art, I would say that the strength of art of contemporary art is to be inclusive of all kinds of production, not to being exclusive. And I think that in your work, we can find this inclusion. So I would like to invite the public who is following us to set in a way their minds to be open to the net through the immersion in your projects, in your work, with another approach, an approach of discovery and of inclusion. So I wish to everyone to uh, start this exploration, especially with uh, uh, the work that is in our platform. So Ricardo and Arcat, and of course, with all your other projects that people can find in the net. So thank you very much. And uh, I really wish you good luck for the show. Thank you. Thank you, thank Evan. You so Thank bye, you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.